South Hills, we are thrilled to be going on a missions trip this summer. We'll be supporting the work of our global campus in Chumbi, Kenya, as well as our long-term partner, Tumaidi International. You may have heard me talk about the verse of the year, Acts 1.8, where it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, this is the perfect opportunity for you to put the ends of the earth bit to practice. There is nothing quite like pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone to serve others. And this summer, we are giving you that very opportunity in Kenya, Africa. The trip will take place in the summer from July 15th through the 25th, and the cost is around $2,500. Now I realize there's a lot more information you'll need to plan for the trip. So if you are interested in serving and ministering in Kenya, I highly recommend you join our upcoming interest meeting. This will give us an opportunity to share important details and answer all the questions you will have. So please scan the QR code on screen to register for the interest meeting. We'll hope you consider joining us in Kenya this summer. And had the opportunity to meet you. My name is JR. I'm the campus pastor here, and we're so glad that you are with us. Can we also take a moment and welcome everyone joining us online? Wherever you're watching from today, we're so glad that you are with us. And uh, I want to give a special shout out. I got to visit, there's someone in our church, a young guy named Tyler, who's been in the hospital uh, basically all week. Got to visit him and his family yesterday, and I know he's watching uh, online this morning. But Tyler, we are praying for you, with you and uh, praying that you were able to go home soon. Um, but man, we're gonna continue this series that we started uh, last Sunday. We're really looking at the life that we were meant to live and understanding that the life that God has called us to live is not supposed to be done solo, but to be done in community, right? I think for many of us, we all understand that life is fast-paced, and for many, Making the most of our time and minimizing distractions is a priority. And while conveniences like drive throughs and food delivery services like Uber Eats or DoorDash, while those things have their benefits, it seems like Jesus valued the significance of sitting at a table with others for a meal. Why is this? And what does it teach you and I about the life we were meant to live in community and not on our own. If you're taking notes, the title of our message today is, Can We Eat Together? Can We Eat Together? Let me pray for us before we get into the message today. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet, light unto our path. I pray that's exactly what it would be for us today. And whether you're in the room or joining us online, if you pray this with me, God, if you speak, I'll listen. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Uh, how many of us love uh, going to uh, a great restaurant, having a great dining experience? How many of us love that? Like, that just is like, a, yeah, most of us, right? Um, uh, Tess and I, back in 2020, uh, we were visiting some friends who live in L.A., and uh, we were living in New York City at the time. And uh, whenever we get the opportunity to travel to a city, one of the first things that we do is we look up all the restaurants we want to go to. We typically eat about six or seven times a day um, to try to get as many restaurants in as possible. And you think I'm kidding, I'm not. Um, and uh, on that trip to LA, there was a restaurant that we wanted to go to. We were lucky to get a reservation. Um, it's called Major Domo. And uh, it was absolutely incredible. They had this, uh, it was like a prime rib situation that was for like four people that you actually had to order when you made the reservation because it took them about 48 hours to actually prepare it. 
And so they only prepared it based on the reservation. And we actually have a picture of, of that prime rib enjoyment um, that was just so good. It was absolutely amazing. And um, yeah, that thing was like bigger than my, it was like almost the, like the length of my shoulders. It's crazy. Um, but can I tell you, as good as the food was, what I remember most about that night is the conversations that we got to have with friends that we had missed, friends that we knew in New York City that had moved to L.A., and it was those moments that really are the things that I hold on to from that night, the laughter, the joy, just remembering certain things that we experienced together, now getting to share this experience together. How many of us have had uh, moments where you're out to eat with friends and, you know, the food is good and, and good food always helps, but like the conversation was so good that uh, you turn around and you realize that the staff of the restaurant had been secretly trying to tell you that they were closing and that you need to leave, right? How many of us have been in situations like that? Or maybe you were uh, out with uh, strangers, right? People that you didn't know that well, but you maybe had some mutual friends. And by the end of the night, because the conversations were so great, you knew that, man, some of these are going to be my people. Or maybe it was just a moment where it was you and someone else around an intimate table sharing sacred words that were life-giving and life-changing and transformative. Anthony Bourdain, he said it best when he said the perfect meal or the best meals often happen in a context that frequently has very little to do with the food itself. A lot can happen at a table. And I think that's why Jesus spent so much of his time at them. The most famous one is often referred to as the Lord's table or the Last Supper. You may know it as the one where all the disciples are gathered around the backside of the table for a painting and I just believe that that moment looks a little bit like this. Check this out. Okay, guys, got the bill here, and we've only got the table till seven, so we need to... Um... Guys, I think the easiest thing is, who had a starter? Then we can sort of go from there. I did your patty. Well, okay, good. Jesus, what's, what's the actual total of the bill? That's not relevant at the moment. I'm just trying to work out who had starters. Oh, just total amount. How many of us are? Twelve? Yeah. Do you it by 12? No, 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 no. We're not splitting it. No, we're not splitting we're not, it. We're not had... going home after this, are we? Guys, can we just get the bill sorted? We're not splitting it. For... Everyone had different things, so we're not just going to split it, mate. Does anyone mind splitting it? No, guys. Guys, we're not splitting it because it's... I've got a system, okay? We all have different stuff, so it's not worth... Wait, 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 then if we call that column one... This is column one, guys. Guys, li listen up. I've got an app. Actually, Jesus, I've got an app. F Philip, don't worry. Let me just do the Phil, app. Phil, I've got a system. Well, don't well, worry, I'll just mate. do the app and it might No, 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 no don't worry. No, we can't. It's really quick. Okay, Everyone I've cracked it. Guys, 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 guys. Whose meal was cooked in a clay oven? Oh, for God's sake. That's not going to clear this It is. No, it, I know it sounds clay ridiculous, oven. but it does. But it's because that's price, because then you have to order the sides with it. So if your meal was cooked in a clay okay, oven... Hands up for clay oven. Honestly, I'm not being funny. I didn't have any wine. I didn't have a starter. I had what they call a light main. Yeah, you ate before you came. I'm not being fucked in at all. Look at him there. Look at him sitting there. Look at him sitting there. He's caused this mess. He's loving it. He's loving it. He's loving it. And you know what, this, I'm not being funny, but this always happens with I know. Jesus. Every time, 12 people, it's too many people. For... Lee, if you're not listening at the end, we're not going to get this cleared, mate, and we have, we have got to move on. Can I just, is everyone happy to just throw we're, in 20 quid, We're 25? not throwing in, guys, we're not, Phil, we're not throwing in 20 quid, guys. I've got a system. I think people aren't responding to you because you're shouting. No, it's not about shouting. Well, just, I'm just, just trying to... Just lower your voice. Honestly, it really upsets me because I've got a system in There's place. Family. What's it's a family. What's a family over there? Yeah, all right, fine. Fine, fine! We'll split it. Okay. Happy? Oh. Well, this is the last supper I'm ever coming to. Look at what Luke 22, 19 through 20, it says this. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20, after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. And in every version of church, right, from cathedrals, to homes, to a cappella singing, to modern worship, the simple elements of bread and the cup have endured as marks of being followers of Jesus. 
Why have these elements and why has meals and tables shown up in Scripture so often? There's a few reasons that this was such a crucial component of Jesus' life and why it should be a significant part of anyone who says that they are a follower of Jesus, why it should be a significant part of their life. And if you're taking notes, here's our big idea today. We have to recognize that Jesus' message is most clearly seen in his meals. Jesus' message is most clearly seen in his meal. And there's one meal that I want to take us to that I think really speaks to the heart of the life that you and I were meant to live. Look at what Matthew 9, verses 9 through 11, it says this. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. If only we listened like Matthew. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees, the religious people, when they saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Oh, those religious people. I know some of you are thinking that, but here's where we have to take a step back. If we are honest, Many of us have asked that same question. Jesus, why would you go be with them? Why would you go spend time with them? And here's what we have to understand. In ancient Israel, the table was used to define a person's community and their identity. And so eating together in this culture was an act of mutual acceptance. And so whoever you invited to sit at your table It was not just sharing a meal with that person. It was you saying, I accept you. You belong in my community, right? You wouldn't eat with someone whose life you didn't approve of and who you are with determined your social status. Whatever table you got invited to determined your social status, a lot like middle school cafeterias. It was the same in Jesus' time. This table-based ranking of society is critical to understanding the choices that Jesus was making. We recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but most of his followers during his life were enamored by his ability to teach or to be an incredible rabbi. But other rabbis and teachers were disturbed by his willingness and desire to sit with tax collectors, to share a meal with prostitutes and other sinners. And this wasn't a, something that a person of status or uh, some, someone who had the wisdom that Jesus had, it wasn't something that they would be seen doing. Yet for Jesus, he was more than comfortable in that space. And it's almost as if that was his plan all along. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Every time Jesus sat at a table... It was a way of showing the nearness of God to every single one of us and his desire to be in relationship with us. Every single time Jesus sat at a table, what he was saying to the people that he invited to sit at the table with him, he was saying that God wants to be near to you, that God desires to be in relationship with you. I think about the message translation paraphrase of First John or John 1, 14. It says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Could God have shouted his message? Yeah. Could he have hired a ghostwriter? Yes. Could he have telepathically communicated all of his truths to us? Yes. But what did he choose to do? He chose to come close. He chose to move into our neighborhoods. And he chose to sit at a table with us. It's as if he was trying to say, I'm here with you. I'm here for you. And I want you to know those two things more than anything else. Everything that separates us from God is removed at the table. It shows his eagerness to welcome us into his life even those that feel far from God. 
And the Pharisees didn't like this. They were upset with who Jesus shared his meals with. Look at what Matthew 9, verse 12, it says this though. When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. He said, healthy people don't need a doctor, it's sick people that do. And if you take a note, you can write this down. Pharisees, the religious people, they saw a rabbi defiling himself by sitting at tables with sinners, but Jesus wanted them to see a doctor healing those who were sick. The Pharisees were so wrapped up in their holiness that they completely misunderstood that it was Jesus who made them holy in the first place. And that's exactly what he came to do, and the table represented that. By simply sharing a table, Jesus was bringing healing to those who needed it most. Uh, The word hospitality originates from the same Latin word that has the root hospital. And the meaning of the original word hospital um, literally means a home for strangers. But what it's come to mean uh, for us today is a place for healing. And there's a direct correlation between being welcomed and being healed that goes far beyond any sort of uh, wordplay. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. When we are loved and accepted for who we really are, welcomed into the life of another person without conditions, it brings healing to our souls. That's why you and I have probably had moments around a table where we have felt welcomed and accepted And even if the food was unbelievable, we leave feeling like, man, I feel so refreshed. I feel restored. I feel renewed because that's the power of the table. We've all been wounded as we navigate life, whether it's from relationships, choices, experiences, judgments, or rejections. And these things often leave scars that we can carry for years. And as we break bread and pour the cup at the Lord's table, we're reminded of his scars and his wounds. And we discover that our wounds and our scars, the things that we've been carrying, are not dismissed from the table. They're not the things that disqualify us from the table, but they're welcomed at the table. The final words that Matthew remembers about that meal are important for us to hear too. Look at what Matthew 9, verse 13, it says this. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And showing mercy requires you and I to be around people. Offering sacrifices does not. Showing mercy is about reflecting our understanding of God by how we treat people around us. Offering sacrifices is about doing something individually for God. It's easy and convenient for us to focus on the offering sacrifices part of our faith because we don't have to deal with the messiness of relationships or people. But Jesus is putting a priority on how we interact with others, how we welcome others, how we serve others, how we love others, how we encourage others, and how we build up others. It's as if he's saying, don't get so caught up on your own holiness that you think you can disconnect from anyone else. Because this table is not ours. It's the Lord's table. And the Lord's table is a reflection of the community that he is building, which often looks nothing like the one we would choose. Look at what Galatians 2, verses 11 through 12, it says this, but when Peter came to Antioch, I had had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised, seen as unrighteous, But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. Circumcision was a sign of being holy. It was a sign of being set apart for religious people. And Gentiles were not circumcised. And what we see is that Peter had happily shared a table with Gentiles until other Jewish men, other religious men showed up. Then he wouldn't sit at a table with them anymore. Here's what's interesting. They all believed in Jesus. 
They all shared the same faith. So what was the issue? Peter, just like us, he chose comfort over community. Peter wanted a church full of people that looked like him, thought like him, had the same preferences and opinions and same views. Like us, he wanted the communion table, the Lord's table to be occupied by people who shared his identity. He wanted to offer sacrifices without having to show mercy. And so are we talking about communion together at church? Are we talking about who we invite to our dinner table? The answer is both. The Last Supper wasn't just communion. It was a dinner. It was a meal that had spiritual implications. Jesus' meal with Matthew and his uh, ratchet friends, ratchet to society then. It wasn't just a meal. It was a meal that had spiritual implications. Peter, his meal with the Gentiles was not just a meal, but it was a meal that had spiritual implications, hence the reason why Peter all of a sudden felt awkward when the religious people showed up, that he was now being seen eating with those that they would never have sat at a table with. And every meal that we share with people in our life, can I tell you, it's not just a meal, but it has spiritual implications. If you say you are a follower of Jesus, it has spiritual implications. We so desperately want to separate or compartmentalize our faith from our lives, but that's not how God designed us or our faith. When we take communion together at church, when we practice the sacrament of communion, it's intended to remind us of the healing that is available to us, that God has pursued a relationship with us, and that wholeness is found when we sit not by ourselves at the table, but when we sit with others at the table. Some of us rarely, if ever, invite anyone to our table at home. Maybe you're too busy, maybe you have preferences, maybe you're worried about what you might be able to offer or what someone might think, but the kingdom of God, if you get nothing else today, understand this, the kingdom of God is a kingdom that is built around the table. And when we don't realize the power of communion, it's not just the practice of a sacrament at church, but the tables in our own homes, we miss out on crucial aspects of our faith. It's so evident in Jesus' life and in his writings and uh, even the first church that intentional connection around a table is a crucial component of experiencing the full life that God intends for us to experience. And here's what this looks like in, in, in real life. Um, I think for many of us, we, we read stories about the Last Supper and we hear people kind of talk about what it means, but I think sometimes you got to kind of see it in action. And I think um, this is really what it's about. Most places, uh, most restaurants in our culture, uh, there's things that maybe limit you from being able to experience them. Maybe you aren't able to get a reservation. Maybe it's too expensive. Whatever it may be, there are limitations. The power of the Lord's table is that there is nothing that you can do that's gonna cause God to say, you know what, you're not welcomed at this table. You don't need a reservation. You don't need to dress a certain way. You don't need to have done certain things to get an invitation to the table. The invitation is freely given and extended to you. Irrespective of your background, irrespective of what you've done, the invitation is there for you. And so please understand this, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, what this table represents, the bread and the cup. There's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing that you're gonna do. There's nothing that you're gonna say that all of a sudden God's like, you know what, you get in. God's not acting like a bouncer, but he's acting like a proud father ready to welcome his kids home. And he's prepared an incredible meal for you. And this is what happens, though. Uh, uh, hey, Luke, I, I want you to come. There's an invitation for you at the table. You can come and join me at this table. Please come. Come and join me at this table. Man, there's, I, I'm so excited for you to 
be able to sit at the Lord's table, Luke, and enjoy this meal. But Luke, you're not coming empty-handed because here's what you're coming with. You're coming with this, and you're coming with this as you sit at the table because we all have weight that we're bringing to the table because we don't come empty-handed. And here's the thing. The weight that you brought to the table, we oftentimes think there's no way I could come sit at the table. Look at, does God know what I'm carrying? Does God know what I've done? And yet he says, no, 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 bring it to the table. It's welcome. In fact, it's, it's, it's what this represents. It's what the cup represents is that you can bring that weight to the table. It does not disqualify you. Actually, maybe it qualifies you even more to sit at this table. And so, Luke, as you sit at the table, look at what God has laid out for you. How amazing is that? And Sinai, you're invited. There's a seat at the table for you. And just like Luke, you're not coming empty-handed, but you're also bringing weight. There are things that you are carrying to the table as you take a seat. But again, whatever you're carrying, it did not stop God from inviting you to the table, but he welcomes you with it. It's not a part from it. It's not having to have it all figured out. It's like, no, no, no. I need you to just come as you are. That's how much I love you. And Stephanie, he invites you to the table as well, and you're not coming empty-handed. But there are some things that you are bringing <laughs> to the table. And here's the thing. Here's what just happened. This is what we do. All of us saw me giving her two things, and we immediately thought, man, she must be terrible. <laughs> the reason they're all different weights is because we see them as different, but God sees them as the same. It does not matter how big, how small, how heavy. It does not disqualify you from sitting at his table. In fact, it's the sin, it's the weight in our life that we were never meant to carry that actually qualifies us to get a reservation at this table, to get a seat at this table. And what happens as we, as you guys experience the beauty and just the joy that comes from this table, what Jesus does, the power of this table, is he says, you know what, that, that bread represents it. It represents me giving my life on the cross for you. And when I give my life on the cross for you, what I'm actually taking is, I'm saying, hey, give me that. Because I want to free you to enjoy the fullness of what's at this table. I want you to not be held back anymore by what's happening, right? Because I think for many of us, we've come to the table, we've sat at the table, but we haven't been able to enjoy anything at the table because we haven't given God what we were never meant to carry. We haven't let go of the thing that this table actually represents. And what Jesus says is when you sit at my table, hey, I'm gonna put it in my carry-on because I got a one-way ticket to Calvary and it's gone once and for all. Past, present, future. That's the power of this table. And yet this table is not limited to or confined to the church. This table is not limited to or confined to a sacrament that we practice once a month. But if you say you are a follower of Jesus, this table is wherever you choose to break bread. Whether that be in a restaurant, whether that be in your home, that is the Lord's table. And what we have to understand is that the life that we were meant to live is one where we would say, Jesus, I wanna take your table wherever I go. Whether it be lunch at work, whether it be inviting people that I know just need community right now into my home, whatever it is, that is the Lord's table. Communion is not just a sacrament that we practice, it's a lifestyle that we live. Communion with God 
for the purpose of communion with others. Can I pray for us? Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. And God, we thank you for your table. Thank you for the power of your table that brings freedom, healing, and wholeness. And God, I thank you that communion is not just something that we practice here at church to remember the incredible sacrifice that you made for us on the cross, but it's about understanding that communion is something that we live out every single day. Communion with you for the purpose of communion with others. And most of the time, it's others that look nothing like us, think nothing like us. But you died for them as well. This table is for them as well. And so as we take a moment to reflect, God, I pray, would you bring up to our minds maybe the last time that we went out of our way to include someone who was maybe feeling on the outside. And would you bring to mind three people, three faces, not the ones that we typically would think of, but three people, three faces that we can share a meal with in the weeks to come. We love you. We bless you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, amen and amen. Thank you, guys. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.